Theistic Evolution Critique, Biological Form, and Information. We've been going through the book Theistic Evolution, that's the cover, um, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique, uh, edited by uh, J.P. Moreland, Stephen Meyer, Christopher Shaw, Ann Gager, and Wayne Grudem. Um, and uh, uh, this chapter is by Stephen Meyer. Before we do that, I want to kind of uh, bring you uh, up to a point that uh, was covered in the introduction, and that is there are several different ways you can uh, view a um, intelligent design hypothesis. You can go with young earth creation, that is an intelligent design hypothesis. You can go with old earth creation, uh, really young life creation is kind of young life, could be old earth, could be young earth, you don't know. Um, and then um, then there's the uh, theistic evolution that believes in intelligent design. Yes, it took billions of years. Yes, things were gradual, but God was involved in it. Um, how gradual, how much involvement of God is up uh, for dispute. Um, and then there is what I would call non-intelligent design theistic evolution. That is, God set it up and then he kept his hands completely off of it until we get down to uh, human history, in which case, if you're a Christian, he had to have stuck his hands in somewhere, if nothing else, at the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and then finally you have where God either never touched it at all, or in fact, in a, a deist God that made the universe and then walked away, although that's technically intelligent design because deism implies that God did set it up at least. Um, and then pure atheistic evolution where God's not involved at all. Now this book is not actually aimed at atheistic evolution, instead it is aimed at non-ID theistic evolution. The concept that God did it but you can't tell. And which is effectively, as far as uh, appearances go, atheistic evolution just insisting that God is behind the scenes all the time. Um, the chapter we're dealing with is Stephen C. Meyer's chapter, and it's in part one, the scientific critique of theistic evolution, and part A of part one, which is the failure of neo-Darwinism. And um, uh, Neo-Darwinism and the Origin of Biological Form and Information is the na full name of the title. As you can see, I've abbreviated it somewhat for the, uh, uh, for the heading. Um, as is customary, there is a summary which basically amounts to an abstract. And the summary uh, goes like this. According to textbook Neo-Darwinian theory, new genetic information arises first as random mutations occur in the DNA of existing organisms. When mutations arise that confer a survival advantage on the organism that possesses them, um, or organisms that possess them, the resulting genetic changes are passed on by natural selection to the next generation. As such changes accumulate, the features of a population begin to change over time. Nevertheless, random, uh, natural selection can only select what random mutations first produce. And for the evolutionary process to produce new forms of life, random mutations must first have produced new genetic information for building novel proteins. Since the late 1960s, however, mathematicians and molecular biologists have argued that producing new functional genes, that is, new genetic information, and proteins via a random mutational search is improbable in the extreme. Nevertheless, until recently, it was impossible to precisely quantify the magnitude of this problem and thus to assess the plausibility of a random search for novel proteins among all the possible amino acid sequences. Recent experiments on proteins performed by Douglas Sachs, that's the person who wrote the first chapter, and others 
however, have shown in a precise quantitative way that functional genetic sequences and their corresponding proteins are indeed too rare to be accounted for by the neo-Darwinian mechanism of natural selection sifting through random genetic mutations. Um, the space or number of possible arrangements are simply too vast. And the available time to search by un undirected mutation too short for them to have been a, a realistic chance of producing even one new gene or protein by undirected mutation and selection in the time allowed for most evolutionary transitions. This chapter develops this argument and other closely related arguments against the creative power of the main evolutionary mechanism and responds to the most prominent objections to these arguments. That's what's going to be discussed in a nutshell. Introduction, a hasty marriage. Theistic evolutionists say that God used the evolutionary process to create the diversity of life on Earth. This statement represents the central claim of theistic evolution, namely that God as creator employed the processes of a random variation in natural selection to cause plants, animals, and indeed every living thing to come to be. Theistic evolutionists hold that since all truth is God's truth, and I would agree with that, and the scientific community has determined the neo-Darwinian mechanism to be the true cause of organismal diversity, Christians should recognize and endorse the divinely creative character of the evolutionary process just as they accept any other well-supported scientific theory as exhibiting God's purpose, purposeful sovereignty over nature in all its dimensions. But a skeptic might wonder if this marriage of Christian theism and evolutionary theory has not been rather hastily arranged. Although the bride and groom are smiling in the reception line, when they happen to glance sidelong at each other, their smiles vanish. A skeptic might further observe that the bona fides of the groom, neo-Darwinian theory, have been in doubt for some time. Not, however, from the bride's overeager church-going family, anxious to secure what they hope will be a conflict-diminishing marriage, but from the groom's secular and visibly morose side of the aisle. The stony expressions of his materialistic kin suggest a deeply significant but largely neglected story. In this chapter, I tell part of that story and argue that there is little, if any, rationale for marrying either theism or Christianity to a failing theory of biological evolution, just as that theory is being abandoned by its own philosophical allies as empirically insufficient or simply false. Thus, I will suggest, to stretch my metaphor, that it is not too late to seek an annulment between theism and neo-Darwinian theory. To stretch it a little further, there are some who are already married and uh, that's gonna involve a divorce if it's gonna happen. The neo-Darwinian theory of evolution, and here the green ellipses tell you that I am omitting material, affirms that all three meanings of evolution discussed in my book, Scientific and Philosophical Introduction to this book, pardon me, in my scientific and philosophical introduction to this book, small-scale microevolutionary change over time, which, by the way, most of us here in this room would agree with, including myself. The two, the common ancestry of all organisms, as seen in Darwin's Tree of Life, Picture of the History of Life, also known as the Theory of a Universal Common Descent. And most importantly, number three, the creative power of the random mutation and natural selection process, which allegedly caused the complexity and diversity of life on Earth. Those are the three uh, parts of evolution. In this chapter, I challenge mainly the third meaning of evolution, the creative power of random mutation and selection, and will do so by raising a criti critical engineering question. How is new biological form and function and the biological information necessary to produce it constructed? Uh, part two, the discont discontinuous origin of major innovations in the history of life. The fossil record of our planet documents the origin of major innovations in organismal form and function. See chapter 10. These episodes, if we take the fossil record at face value, often occur abruptly or discontinuously, meaning that new arising biological forms bear little or no resemblance to what existed earlier in the fossil record. And he goes on to talk about Darwin's doubt, which we've covered in this class um, and in some depth before. And he talks about the Cambrian explosion, which of course is covered in Darwin's doubt, and that it's geologically sudden. 
Many other such abrupt appearances or discontinuous origins are documented in the fossil record. For example, the first winged insects, birds, flowering plants, mammals, and other groups also appear abruptly in the fossil record with no apparent connection to putative ancestors in the lower and older layers of fossil-bearing sedimentary rock. <coughs> Evolutionary theorist <coughs> Eugene Koonin describes this as a biological Big Bang pattern. As he notes, and remember this is Koonin, an evolutionist, major transitions in biological evolution show the same pattern of sudden emergence of diverse forms at a new level of complexity. The relationships between major groups within an emergent new class of biological entities are hard to decipher and do not seem to fit the tree pattern that, following Darwin's original proposal, remains the dominant description of biological evolution. Doesn't fit the tree. In The Origin of Species, Darwin depicted the history of life as a gradually unfolding branching tree. Nevertheless, Darwin himself acknowledged that the, the sudden appearance of many major groups of organisms in the fossil record did not fit easily with his picture of gradual evolutionary change. The abrupt appearance of the first animals in the Cambrian period and the abrupt appearance of many other groups also challenged Darwin's claim that natural selection acting on random variations had produced all the new forms of life. Darwin saw natural selection as slow and gradual because of the intrinsic logic of the process. If you could get a suddenly a bird from a, a, uh, a lizard, you're in trouble. Yet as Darwin conceded, conceived of the process, the variations responsible for permanent changes in a population would have had to be relatively <coughs> modest or slight in any given generation. Major or large-scale variations, what evolutionary biologists would later term macro mutations, would inevitably produce dysfunction, deformities, or even death. Only minor variations would be viable and therefore heritable. So you had to progress slowly along that path. Significant changes to organismal forms and function would thus require many hundreds of millions of years, precisely what appears unavailable in the case of many salient episodes of evolutionary innovation, such as the Cambrian explosion, the angi angiosperm or flowering plant big bloom during the Cretaceous period, 130 million years ago, that, that's the conventional dating of course, or the mammalian radiation to the Eocene period, about 55 million years ago. Darwin hoped the mystery of the missing ancestral fossils would be solved by future geological discoveries documenting the gradual transitions his theory predicted. However, for major fossil radiations documenting the or origin of novel forms of life, the opposite has occurred. In the 150 years since the publication of The Origin, paleontologists have combed geological strata worldwide, looking for the expected precursors to many major groups of organisms, but they have not found the pattern of gradual change that Darwin anticipated. Instead, new findings have often shown explosions of novel biological form to have been even more dramatic than Darwin realized. A deeper mystery, how to build animals. By the time an animal is large enough to be entombed in sediment and thus to show up later in the paleontological record as a macroscopic fossil body with distinctive and complex anatomical features, that enable us to recognize it as the remains of an animal, the causes or processes that brought the animal originally into existence as a live, living being have already done their work. This means that the fossil record, fascinating though it may be, lies downstream of a deeper and more fundamental biological mystery. The abrupt appearance of novel fossil forms represents the paleontological signal or detectable consequence of some earlier acting causes that were sufficiently sufficient to build animal structures and functional complexity within the time available. The mystery we face then is simply this. What caused the origin of novel animal forms? In particular, could the neo-Darwinian process of random mutation and natural selection have built the Cambrian and other animals and done so quickly enough to account for the pattern in the fossil record? That question became much more acute in the last two decades of the 20th century and now into the 21st as biolo biologists have learned more about what it takes to build an animal. The information enigma. 
1953, when James Watson and Francis Crick elucidated the structure of the DNA molecule, they made a startling discovery. The structure of DNA allows it to store information in the form of a four-character digital code. Strings of precisely sequenced chemicals called nucleotide bases store and transmit the assembly instructions, the information for building the crucial protein molecules that the cell needs to survive. Francis Crick uh, made the sequence hypothesis. As Richard Dawkins has acknowledged, the machine code of the D of genes is can uncannily computer-like. Or as Bill Gates has noted, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. Skipping a paragraph, uh, talks about computers and then says, to build new forms of life from simpler pre-existing forms also requires the generation of new information. The Cambrian explosion, for example, was marked by an explosion of new animal body parts, body plans. But bu building new body plans requires new organs, tissues, and cell types. And new cell types requires many kinds of specialized or dedicated proteins. Animals with gut cells, to cite just one example, require new digestive enzymes, which are a type of protein. But building new proteins requires genetic information stored on the DNA molecule. Thus, building new animals with distinctive new body plans requires, at the very least, vast amounts of new inf genetic information. And as he notes, that's not all. Of, there is, of course, epigenetic information as well that's required. Well, this is just the minimum requirements, not the total requirements. But if that is so, is it plausible to think that the neo-Darwinian mechanism of natural selection acting on random mutations could have produced the highly specific changes in the DNA uh, sequences or other hereditary patterns necessary to generate novel animal forms? There are several compelling reasons to think not. The problem of the origin of information. According to neo-Darwinian theory, new genetic information arises first as random mutations occur in the DNA of existing organisms. Random here means without respect to functional outcome, entailing that there can be no inherent directionality or telos to mutational events that would require intelligence. When mutations arise that strictly by chance confer a functional advantage on the organisms produce, uh, possessing them, thereby increasing their reproductive output, the resulting genetic changes will be passed on by natural selection to the next generation. As such changes accumulate, the features of a population will change over time. Yet natural selection can only select what random mutations first stumble upon. Thus, for natural selection to preserve any significant functional innovation, let alone a new form of animal life, random mutations must, at a minimum, first produce new genetic information for building new proteins. Indeed, natural selection and subsequent heritable change within a population await the deliverance of the mutational process because it is there that selectable function and morphological novelty must first arise. The creation, the selection can select, but the creation must be done by the mutations. Searching for new genes and proteins in a combinatorial haystack. If mutation is occurring without direction, however, the evolutionary mechanism faces what amounts to a needle in the haystack search, what mathematicians call a combinatorial search problem. In mathematics, the term combinatorial refers to the number of possible ways that a set of objects can be arranged or combined. Many simple bicycle locks, for example, can uh, comprise four dials with 10 settings on each dial. A thief encountering one of these locks, and lacking bolt cutters, faces a combinatorial search problem because there are 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, or 10,000 possible ways of combining the possible settings on each of the four dials, but only one combination that will open the lock. How does this bear in the origin of biological information? It turns out that it is extremely difficult to assemble new genes or proteins by the random mutation and natural selection process because the sheer number of possible sequences that must be searched by mutations in the available time. As the length of the required gene or protein grows, the number of possible base or amino acid sequence combinations of that length grows exponentially. For example, using the 20 protein uh, 
forming amino acids, there are 20 t uh, to the 2, or 400 ways to make a 2 amino acid combination, since each position could feature any one of the 20 different amino acids. Similarly, there are 20 to the 3, or 8,000 ways to produce, to, uh, to make a three amino acid sequence, and 20 to the fourth are 160,000 ways to make a sequence four amino acids long, and so on. Yet most functional proteins are made of hundreds of amino acids, thus even a relatively short protein of say 150 amino acids represents one sequence among an astronomically large number of other possible sequence combination approximately 10 to the 195th power. Intuitively, this suggests that the odds of finding even a single functional sequence, that is a working gene or protein, as the result of random genetic mutations may be prohibitively small, even taking into account the time available to the evolutionary process. Imagine, however, that we now encounter a really committed bicycle thief who patiently searches the sequence space of possible lock combinations at the rate of one combination every 10 seconds. If our hypothetical thief had 15 hours and took no breaks, he could generate more than half, or 54,000 of the 10, or 5,400 of the 10,000 of the total lock uh, combinations, possible combinations of a four dial bike lock. He'd have a better than one chance in two of getting the lock open. Given this, the probability that he will happen upon the right combination exceeds the probability that he will fail. In that case, it would be more likely than not that he will succeed in opening the lock by random search. And the chance hypothesis, that is, the hypothesis that he will su succeed in opening the lock via random search is therefore also more likely to be true than false. But now imagine a much more complicated lock. Instead of four dials, this lock has 10 dials. Instead of 10,000 possible combinations, this lock has 10 to the 10th power, or 10 billion possible um, uh, combinations. With only one combination that will open the lock out of 10 billion, a prohibitively small ratio, it is much more likely that the thief will fail even if he devotes his entire life to the task. If the thief did nothing but sample combinations at random at a rate of one every 10 seconds for an entire 100 year lifetime, which is starting at a baby and finishing just before you die for a long life, he would still sample only about 3% of the total number of combinations on a lock that is that complex. In this admittedly contrived case, it would be much more likely than not that he would fail to open the lock by random search. So what about relying on random mutations to search for a new DNA base sequence capable of directing the construction of a new functional protein? Is a random mutational search for a new gene capable of producing a new protein more like the search for the combination on the four dial or the 10 dial lock? As our examples show, the ultimate probability of the success of a random search and the plausibility of any hypothesis that affirms the success of such a search depends upon both the size of the space that needs to be searched and the number of opportunities available to search it. Scientists have needed to know how rare or common functional arrangements of DNA bases capable of generating new proteins are among all the possible pro arrangements for a protein of a given length. That's because in genes and proteins, unlike the, our bike lock example, there are many functional combinations of bases and amino acids as opposed to just one among the vast number of total combinations. Thus, in order to assess the plausibility of a random search, we need to know the overall ratio of functional to non-functional sequences in the DNA. And that's a tough job to do. Molecular biologists, molecular biologists have long known that the number of possible combinations corresponding to any given sequence of DNA or chain of amino acids is extremely large and grows exponentially with the length of the molecule in question. But recent ex experiments in molecular bi biology and protein science have settled the issue. They have established that DNA-based sequences capable of making the complex three-dimensional structures called folds that characterize functional proteins are extremely rare among the vast number of possible sequences. A protein fold is a distinctive, stable, complex three-dimensional structure 
that enables proteins to perform specific biological functions. Since proteins are crucial to almost all biological functions and structures, protein folds represents the smallest unit of structural innovation in living systems. But how rare are protein folds? While working at Cambridge University from 1990 to 2003, molecular biologist Doug Axe, again, that's the person who wrote the first uh, chapter that we looked at last week, set out to answer this question using a sample technique called site-directed site mutagenesis. His experiments revealed that for every DNA sequence that generates a short functional protein fold of just 150 amino acids in length, there are 10 to the 77th power non-functional combinations, 10 to the 77th amino acid arrangements, that will not fold into a stable three-dimensional protein structure capable of forming, performing a biological function. Skipping on, thus for every functional gene or protein fold, there is a vast, exponentially large number of corresponding non-functional sequences through which the evolutionary process would need to search. Axe's experimentally derived estimate placed that ratio, the size of the haystack in relation to the needle, at 10 to the 77th a non-functional sequences for every functional gene or protein fold. That ratio implies that the difficulty of a mutational search for a new gene or novel protein fold is equivalent to the difficulty of searching for just one combination on a lock with 10 digits of, on each of 77 dials. Could random genetic mutations effectively search a space of possibilities that large in the time available to the Cambrian explosion, or even the entire history of life on Earth? Clearly, 10 to the 77th power represents a huge number. To put that number in context, consider that there are only 10 to the 65th atoms in our galaxy. Consider that every time an organism reproduces and generates a new organism, an opportunity occurs to generate and pass on a new gene sequence as well. But there in the entire three and a half billion year history of life on Earth, only 10 to the 40th individual organisms have ever lived. Meaning that at most only 10 to the 40th power of such opportunities have occurred. Yet 10 to the 40th power represents only a small fraction of 10 to the 77th power, only one 10 trillion trillion trillionth or <coughs> or one over 10 to the uh, 37 to be exact. It follows that it is overwhelmingly more likely than not that a random mutational search would have failed to produce even one new functional information rich DNA sequence and protein in the entire history of life on Earth. Consequently, it also follows that the hypothesis that such a random search succeeded is more likely to be false than true. And of course, the building of new animals would require the creation of many new proteins, not just one. Skipping along a little bit, the twin challenges of constructing and modifying body plans. Yet in order to explain novel facts in the history of life, biologists must account not only for new genes and proteins, but also for the origin of new body plans, where a body plan can be understood as a unique arrangement of body parts and tissues. Within the past decade, developmental biology has dramatically advanced our understanding of how body plans are built during the process of embryological development. Studies in developmental biology have shown that changes in biological form require attention to timing, especially in the expression of the genetic information necessary to build a body plan. The need for careful choreography in the expression of genetic information poses two additional but closely related problems for the neo-Darwinian mechanism, both of which provide other scientific reasons for doubting the creative power of the mutation selection mechanism. Embryonic lethals, an early acting body plan affecting mutations. First though, evolutionary biologists have long touted mutations as a kind of a silver bullet capable of generating unlimited in innovation. Developmental biologists have discovered that only certain kinds of mutations those that occur early in the embryological development of an animal have the potential for altering an entire animal body plan, that is, for producing major evolutionary change. Conversely, mutations in genes that are expressed late in the development of an animal as it progresses from embryo to adult form 
will not affect the body plan of the animal for two reasons. First, mutations expressed late in development will affect relatively fused cells. Second, late in development, the basic outlines of the body plan will already have been established, so you're not going to alter them. As evolutionary geneticists Bernard John and George Miklos explain, macroevolutionary change requires changes in very early embryogenesis. But this fact poses a difficulty for all theories of macroevolution that rely on mutations to generate major changes in form. Why? Because development of biologists such as Christian uh, Nusslein Volhard and Eric Weishaus, pardon my German, have also <coughs> discovered that mutations uh, that occur early in the developmental trajectory of an animal from embryo to adult form are inevitably lethal. Mutations will be much more likely to be deadly if they disrupt a functionally embedded structure that arises early in development, such as a spinal column, than they will be if the mutations affect more isolated anatomical features that occur later in development, such as fingers or skin. This problem of embryonic lethals has created a dilemma for evolutionary theorists. The kind of mutations needed to generate new body plans, in particular, early acting beneficial body plan altering mutations never occur. The kind of mutations that do occur, late-acting mutations that affect small clusters of somatic cells, don't generate new body plans. The kind of mutation we need in order to produce new body plans we don't get. The kind we get, we don't need. How then does the evolutionary process overcome this difficulty produce major changes in animal form? Evolutionary biologists have not answered this question. The immutability of developmental gene regulatory networks, or consider a related difficulty. Developmental biologists have also discovered that building an animal does not just require new genes and proteins, but instead it requires integrated networks of genes and proteins called developmental gene regulatory networks, or DGRNs. A whole bunch of proteins have to operate essentially as a unit. These networks of genes and their protein products regulate the timing of gene expression as animals develop. The products of the genes, proteins and RNAs, in these integrated networks transmit signals, others are known as transcriptional regulators or transcription factors, that influence the way individual cells develop and differentiate during this process. The late Eric Davidson of California Institute of Technology explored the regulatory logic of animal development more deeply than perhaps any other modern biologist. In the course of his investigations, he not only discovered what these networks of genes do, he also discovered that what they never do, namely, change significantly. Davidson explained why. The integrated complexity of the G DGRNs, which he likened to integrated circuits, makes them stubbornly resistant to fundamental restructuring without breaking. Instead, Davidson discovered that mutations affecting the DGRNs that regulate body plan development inevitably lead to catastrophic loss of the body part or loss of viability altogether. As he noted, there is always an observable consequence if a DGRN subcircuit is interrupted. Since these consequences are always catastrophically bad, flexibility is minimal. Given this, how could a new body plan and the new GGRNs necessary to produce it ever evolve from a pre-existing body plan and set of DGRNs, trying to change it gradually from one to the other? Davidson had made clear that no one really knows. Contrary to classical evolution theory, the processes that drive the small changes observed as species diverge cannot be taken as models for the evolution of the body plans of animals. He elaborates. Neo-Darwinian evolution assumes that all process works the same way. So that evolution of enzymes or flower colors can be used as a current proxies for study of evolution of the body plan. It erroneously assumes that, changes, that change in protein coding sequence is the basic cause of change in developmental program. And it erroneously assumes that evolutionary change in the body plan morphology occurs by a continuous process. All of these assumptions are basically counterfactual. Oof. Skipping on, Darwin was troubled by the problem of missing fossil intermediates. 
not only have those forms, for the most part, not been found, but for the abrupt appearance of new animal forms during the history of life, but the abrupt in, uh, appearance, uh, illus <coughs> illustrates a deeper and more profound engineering problem that Neo-Darwinian theory has failed to address. The problem of building a new form of animal life by gradually transforming one tightly integrated system of information-rich genetic components and their products into another. Now, answering my critics, challenge from a mainstream evolutionary biologist, first in 2013, a leading paleontologist and evolutionary biologist named Charles Marshall wrote a paper. Um, he, didn't, he disputed the claim that significant amounts of new genetic information would have been necessary to build the new animals. Specifically, Marshall claimed that the rewiring of developmental gene regulatory networks would have sufficed to produce new animals from a set of pre-existing genes. But they can't, so how does he answer that? Elastic control networks required. First, to account for the origin of novel animal body plans in the Cambrian period, Marshall suggested that developmental gene regulatory networks must have been more flexible or labile in the past in a way that would allow them to be rewired. In other words, the present is not the key to the past. For this reason, Marshall and other defenders of evolution theory reverse the epistemological priority and violate the principle of the historical scientific method as pioneered by Charles Lyell, Charles Darwin, and others. Rather than treating our present experimentally based knowledge as the key to evaluating the plausibility of theories about the past, Marshall and others use speculative evolutionary theories about what they think must have happened in the remote past to reinterpret our present observations and experimentally based knowledge of what does and does not occur in biological systems. In other words, the requirements of evolutionary doctrine trump our observations about how nature and living organisms actually behave. What we know best from observation takes a backseat to prior beliefs about how life must have arisen. Shall we say faith in the teeth of evidence? A deeper problem, um, the genes and gene regulatory networks contain genetic information. And where does that come from? Uh, anatomical novelties require a genetic toolkit, which means multiple proteins, which means you won the lottery um, not just 10 to the 77th once, but 10 to the 77th multiple times. Um, rewiring, genetic, uh, rewiring networks requires informational input. And the challenges from theistic evolutionists. More recently, two prominent theistic evolutionists have also challenged my critique of the efficiency or efficacy of mutation and natural selection as a mechanism for generating new genetic information. Deborah Hardsma of the Biologos Foundation has claimed that new studies show that functional genes and proteins are not extremely rare. We'll discuss that more next week, despite what Douglas Axe's experiments have indicated. Dennis Venema, a biologist at Tr Trinity Western University and a close colleague of Harzma at Biologos, has argued that the evolution of an enzyme capable of digesting synthetic nylon shows that new information capable of building a new protein can arise by mutation and selection in the time available to the evolutionary process. Um, uh, at least four other studies using different methods of estimating the rarity of functional protein have confirmed AXA's multi-year experimental study showing their extreme rarity in the sequence space of possible amino acid combinations. And that's the comment that he makes about um, Harzma. Skipping over quite a bit, and partly because um, we can spend a lot of time in the weeds there, uh, I, I will just say that I was actually partly involved in in uh, the part of the answer to uh, 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 Venema's comments. Uh, Challenge from atheistic evolutionists, natural selection and random mutation and non-random process. Um, and of course, this is the Richard Dawkins, which is really relatively shallow. Again, 
mistaking the fact that all of the work has to be done by random mutation. Natural selection just simply sorts that work. All this means that as a mechanism for the production of novel genetic information, natural selection does nothing to help generate functional DNA base or amino acid sequences. Rather, it can only preserve such sequences if they confer a functional advantage once they have originated. It follows that even if natural selection considered separately from the mutation constitutes a non-random process, the evolutionary mechanism as a whole depends upon the inelimitable element of randomness, namely various populated or mu observed mutational processes, a point that even other evolutionary biologists and friendly partisans to Krauss and Dawkins acknowledged after the debate in Toronto. Larry Moran and P.Z. Myers, for example, both criticized Krauss and Dawkins for mischaracterizing the neo-Darwinian mechanism as wholly non-random, with Moran specifically blaming Krauss's uncritical reliance upon Dawkins as a source of his misinformation. And by the way, it might be noted that Lawrence Krauss is a physicist by profession, not a biologist, and therefore it is a little more understandable that he might believe the Dawkins when uh, these other two people didn't. Skipping on, conclusion, it follows from all this that theists who think they must affirm the neo-Darwinian mechanism as God's means of creation are badly mistaken, and for scientific reasons. Consequently, there is no compelling reason to marry neo-Darwinism with a Judeo-Christian understanding of creation. The mechanism of natural selection and random mutation does not provide a remotely plausible account of how novel biological form and information might have arisen. Therefore, it is as unlikely to have been the means by which God created life as it is unlikely to be the true explanation for the origin of novel biological form and information. Now, that's the end of the chapter. My own comments, I think Steve Meyer uh, gives an overview of his book, Darwin's Doubt, in a reply to his critics. I think this is useful to, for two reasons. Number one, for those who are intimidated by the book or who get lost in the details, the summary is helpful. Number two, the reply to his critics is quite useful and not easily available elsewhere. You have to search in multiple places to find the critics and the reply. One criticism is, criticism is not addressed here but will be addressed in the next chapter. Uh, that is one study that suggested that the probabilities are more like 10 to the uh, uh, 11th, I believe, if, uh, which is relatively small probability. Um, rather than trying to go over all that in one session, we'll, we'll leave that for the next, uh, next week. Uh, notice what is happening. What we instinctively sense turns out to be true and the claims that large amounts of information can be created without intelligence turn out to be empty. The emperor really doesn't have any clothes and claims to the contrary are either simplistic, wishful thinking, or downright deceptive. And of course, once you get a designer in there, the identity of the designer becomes important and the whole project of explaining life without a designer comes crashing down. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment back there. <coughs> You've covered a lot of territory today. Yes. Uh, these discussions have been around for decades. Uh, what bothers me a little, not in the way you represent it, but in the way the book we're going through uh, couches everything in the extreme. Uh, Richard Dawkins' solution to this problem uh, could be illustrated this way. We have these 10 locks with 10 combinations. When you try in one lock a combination that is right, Dawkins gives it a little selective advantage, so it stays. 
he calls this cumulative selection. Uh, it, it is, so to speak, that the next bike lock you you get, you set it to the 10 di dial that worked and then you move it one Yes, or two. in other words, you gradually get all 10 locks with the right choice if each one of the right choices confers at least a little advantage yes. by itself. And that's what cumulative selection is. Uh, I thought the presentation today did not represent that as as clearly as it might, as a as sort of an in-between point. Personally, and we've been over these discussions many, many times with, uh, in fact, uh, I used Dawkins' climb, Climbing Mount Improbable as a mm -hmm. textbook in the seminar I taught, where he really brings in cumulative selection. Uh, I think you have to give him some credit, but it doesn't, it can't come close to providing the answers that this book you're reviewing is calling for. And, and in sense, the big picture, I agree completely with, with uh, what apparently this book is saying. But I think we need to recognize along the way there is at least a little credibility if you can have these individual changes retained. And by retaining, they need to give some selective advantage. Yeah. But uh, our kids never found that convincing, so. Yeah. Yes. I wonder why he doesn't say anything about the problem that you keep accumulating more and more um, false, uh, I shouldn't say false, uh, uh, detrimental is the word I want to use. Detrimental mutations. Uh, this thing is going to degenerate. Uh, at the figures he gives us, you know, it's going to degenerate our function long before uh, you're going to get another good mutation to go with it. Uh, you're, you're basically raising the problem of genetic entropy. Yeah, sure. Her, this is uh, Sanford's uh, Sanford's argument uh, per se, but it. This is a real, I mean, this is part of the equation. It, it is, and most people ignore it. Uh, I think Sanford is the only person that's really published extensively on this. Um, I think Sanford's right, though. Um, uh, it will interest you that there's a new book out by Michael Behe that hints in the title that he may be a, a dealing with the same problem. And if so, I think Sanford is, is going to go mainstream intelligent design. And of course, that has implications of its own. But how are you going to have any survival value when so many of the things are wrong? I mean, why are you going to pick this one when you got thousands of others wrong? Uh, yeah. The, the, yeah. The basic system isn't, isn't vi vi uh, viable. Yeah. Well, it, it's one of those things that um, um, when you have uh, when you have a lot of wrong ways to do something, then either rapidly or perhaps more slowly, you aim towards the eventual extinction of the species. If you can't correct those, and it's pretty uh, evident that at least uh, creatures the size of humans, you can't correct it. And so for, for all of us, we're, we're gradually heading downhill. Basically, it's a Mueller's ratchet with a vengeance. It's remarkable that uh, this thing goes on and uh, the major trend is ignored and the exception is just touted as a, a success. Well, when people know what they need to believe, they will find ways to bridge the gap. And the less knowledge they have, but the more knowledge they think they have, the easier it's going to be to bridge that gap. 
Um, and, and yet, you know, when you look at it without that kind of pressure that is out there, either internal pressure or external pressure, you realize that in fact the emperor doesn't have clothes. And that, that what's sustaining it is a sociological expectation that you will not criticize the emperor's clothes. That's what's really happening. Just one other comment came to mind. Uh, the American, uh, or the starling that we know across North America was introduced from Europe. Uh, I think it's about 150 years ago. There are now at least 20 distinct genetic races in that population. Which was, which was which was which orig was originally homogenous. Yeah. Now these may not be important differences, but they're recognizable genetic uh, the, changes. The bird watcher could could pick them out. Yes, and this, no matter how you look at it, does give some credence to variation in natural selection making difference. Is it enough? No, nowhere near, in my judgment. But nonetheless, there is this kind of data available to sustain a hopeful defense of Darwinian or uh, neo-Darwinian evolution. Well, I think that on the species uh, uh, level, other than the fact that probably the most primitive is actually the most. Uh, information rich uh, that you don't get new enzymes out of this um, that other than that one caveat um, I think that most creationists would agree that that kind of evolution if you want to call it evolution accounts for uh, most of the uh, variation that we see today uh, and in including some variations that we now call species. You know, the, the kaibab squirrel in the, uh, on the, on the uh, north and south side of the Grand Canyon has diverged into what are now recognized as two species and like your starling examples, it doesn't take a uh, a mammal watcher very much time to figure out which side of the Grand Canyon he's on by figuring out which kind of squirrel is there. Um, because one is all on the north and one is all on the south and they've diverged. Um, some of that may be random, some of that may be adaptation for differences in elevation, temperature, whatever. Uh, that that uh, preserved one set of variations on one side and another set of variations on the other side. Um, and in some cases, it's pretty obvious that the variations are uh, protective, specifically in the case of white animals in the uh, northern climes. So polar bears you know about, but, but there's also, you know, rabbits that are white, there are, uh, or, or hares that are white. Uh, there are uh, ptarmigans that are white. You know, it's not accidental. So, you know, natural selection does exist. But in the examples that I can give you from, from, this, uh, from the, you know, the north of the North America and presumably the north of uh, probably Eurasia as well, um, it's all degenerative. That is, you lose the ability to produce some protein. Um, even in the case of Lenski's experiment, you lose the ability to keep citrate outside of the cell uh, during, I think it's anaerobic metabolism, which presumably helped uh, uh, bacteria in the wild but now that they're in the petri dish and you're giving them only citrate, why well, it's an advantage to be able to eat it all the time. See, so 
what, you, what you're doing is you're losing information that used to be there. Now, um, could you ever produce a new enzyme? Actually, yes, you can. And nylonase is a good example. But nylonase requires two amino acid changes, which I'd have to look it up, but I bet you it was two uh, base pair changes uh, in, the, uh, in the DNA, and that's all. And that is actually within reach of bacteria. Uh, some studies have suggested that more than six base pairs are not in reach of bacteria throughout all of biological time, and assuming that biological time includes billions of years. Um, and that means that to get from, let's say, um, uh, a, an enzyme that works on biotin to another enzyme that's fairly similarly shaped that uh, works on, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was, it's an entirely different uh, subject that it's in the paper of Engager and, and company, um, that those that those reactions, uh, that the proteins that catalyze those reactions are outside of the range because they require at least seven different changes, even though the general shape of the protein is the same. And, you know, when you're talking about brand new proteins, which humans have a few hundred of them, and some of them have to do with the brain, you have to create that in less than six million years by conventional standards. It's not going to happen without intelligent design. It's just not. That's basically the equivalent of, of let's say, you know, the, 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 the back of Mount Improbable is portrayed as a smooth climb. Yes. Well, it's not smooth. It has jumps of, you know, 10 to the 70th power all the time. And you maybe can use up all of your luck making one of those jumps. And then you have to start all over again and, and use up luck that you don't even have time to create to get the next jump. But on the other hand, don't at least, uh, I have found it rewarding to imagine, imagine, to suggest that the creator put specifically together organisms that could adapt to new situations and survive and continue. Oh, I agree. Rather than being dead end. I agree. Uh, every time they face something new. Yeah. And so you have this tension with how far can this go or, or whatever. Yeah. And, and I think the creator may very well have, have created bacteria with a, uh, with a protein ace that was close enough that when nylon came along, it could make the jump with, uh, you know, in a, in a biologically plausible time. Apparently, it takes about 30 or 40 years on the average to, to actually get those two mutations to work. So, you know, it's a, it's a possibility, it's a probability, a reasonable probability at that point. You're better li more likely than not to get there. But that's a simple one. And the problem is that we have things that are way more complex than that, way less probable than that. And you know, after you keep telling me that Arnold Sh uh, Schwarzenegger won the California lottery, you know, or I guess it is Jerry Brown now, or who knows, Gavin Newsom, won the California lottery. And he won it again, and he won it again, and he won it again. At some point you start saying, you know, I think this thing is rigged. And I think life is rigged. I think you're making a political comment right now. <laughs> no. Uh, th I, this is the way we'll pay for all the new stuff Newsom is going to bring in. <laughs> well, that may be true, but that's a different story. <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose we had uh, uh, 
this does occur, and as you pointed out, uh, degeneration is sometimes the case. And uh, when you have degeneration, you can have tremendous changes, as in parasites. And parasites leave patterns of molecules that indicate that uh, they don't use these molecules anymore. They still j just make them because they just happen to be there. And, uh, and, and now you have degenerative segments that don't mean anything. But they don't need them because they, they depend on their host for what right. they used to make. By the way, for the rest of you who may not know, uh, um, uh, uh, Ariel Roth here has done some significant work in parasitology. I, I question that statement, but uh, I try. <laughs> I try once in a while. Comment back there. We need to remember that there is more or less a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Before class started, the gentleman over here was talking about people with lots of letters after their names, etc. And I would like to point out to all of us who have been in higher education for a great amount of time, whether as a student or as faculty, that when you take a 17-year-old and you put them in the classroom with 200 other 17-year-olds, and the 17-year-old looks around and says, wow, what am I doing here? These guys must all be smarter than me. And they're terrified of their lack of wisdom. And then we put Dr. Wise person up in front who is so wise that everybody hangs on his every word. And the next year they get another Dr. Wise person and then they add them up and add them up. By the time they get out, they have almost no chance of doing any critical thinking on their own. They have been so indoctrinated by whoever they see as the great authority that they're stuck. And then we wonder, why do smart people still believe in evolution? They can't get out of it. They're stuck. Or any other thing that they may have been stuck in in a classroom. And so I would suggest that we not be too hard on the people who have gone through and become the experts. Because in my mind, there isn't such a thing as an expert. There's just somebody who studied something different than you. That's all. They're not an expert. And whatever it was that they discovered, next year you may disprove. So, you know, all this stuff is fun and fun and interesting to talk about, but it has great implications for kids as they go to college and university. Yes. And I would like to make one other comment that's really off of this. There are what now, a thousand different breeds of dogs? Yeah. Not one of them has ever turned into a chicken. Or even a cat. Or even a cat. <laughs> so my point is that, okay, I, you know, they're smart, Dawkins and all the rest of them, but don't try to enforce your thinking, whatever it may be, I don't care how you think, you may be the smartest physicist out there, don't tell me about God. Don't tell me about your opinion there's no God. Keep it to yourself. You're super smart or you're super stupid, keep it to yourself. You don't need to try to enforce your thinking and your idea and try to run Christianity down because you don't believe it for some reason. And, and you know, I don't know what your problem is or, or whether it's the preacher back from the 16th century that said everybody's going to hell and whatever, that's okay. You know, deal with it. But don't have all these hypotheses and say, okay, how can the world be 6,000 years old? That's stupid. That's not intelligent. You know, that, that's for the simple people. Keep it to yourself. You write books and you write books and you try to tell people that all the rest of us are idiots because we believe in Christianity, but you're the smart guy because you're a physicist, whatever you are, you're an MD, you wh whoever you may be. That's okay. I respect knowledge, and I respect all the letters behind your name. 
but don't try to tell the rest of us that are no count because we cannot see your point. I had professors here in Loma Linda, they were super smart people, but they could not transfer their knowledge to the simple people. You could be a super PhD, but the mark of a true teacher is if you can impart some of it, even a quarter of your knowledge to your students when they go through the, your class. You know, to you math may be very simple, physics may be very simple, but unless you make it so simple that a simple person can understand it. And that's the difference with Christ, because Christ, when he taught, he taught for the simple people. He did not teach like the Pharisees and the Sadducees that knew everything, they had all the PhDs, whatever, and the simple people could not understand. That's why Christ taught in parables, paraboles in Greek, okay? So that's my take. I, you know, I don't have anything against the smart people, but anyway, that's the end of that. Thank you. Well, I think that that's a very good note to end on. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next week we will, uh, uh, I saw it. I'd like to add just one, one point, and that is the best teachers I had imparted to me the criticality and the ability to think each idea through for myself. Yes. And if the education doesn't do that, it's indoctrination. Uh, that's that's and, exactly uh, right. I would say in general, uh, science has been more successful in training uh, young people going out who have that, it, that sense of uh, intellectual independence yes. than perhaps other disciplines. Yes, it does remind me. You're taught me. not to respect the authorities, to uh, criticize them mm -hmm. just like you would everything else. It, it does remind me of a statement uh, that was made once that uh, the true uh, goal of education is to create uh, men who are, are thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts.